Hey everyone, today I'm gonna to do something a little bit different. A few days ago, I released a new seven hour training course on our website called Funica Pro 10.6 Core Training that I started working on way back in October of last year. Now, one of the things I did differently compared to the previous versions of this training is that I made it more modular so that someone without any experience in using Funica Pro could create a video from start to finish in under 60 minutes. Then the rest of the training would go deeper and flesh out a lot of the concepts that I introduced in the first module. So that brings me to today's video. I'm releasing the entire 60 minute lesson of my training along with the media so that you can follow along with me. Now I've never really done this before so it's kind of an experiment and I'm really interested in your feedback. If you consider yourself an experienced user, I'm certain you'll pick up some valuable tips along the way and you'll get to see my creative process for how I go about creating a video for our YouTube channel. I've included hyperlinks so you can jump past the more basic parts or jump to the sections that interest you. And finally, if you're interested in my full seven hour training course, there's a link below and a code that will give you 20% off. So with that, let's get started. Because I believe that doing is better than just watching, I created this lesson for you to follow along using your own copy of Funka Pro. If you don't own Funka Pro, Apple provides a free 90 day trial version you can download from their website. For convenience, I provided the link below. To download our follow along media, click the link below and a zip file titled Anamorphic Media will download to your computer. Once the download is complete, locate and double click the file to uncompress it. The folder contains some video clips and a watermark music file from Shutterstock. The link to purchase the non watermark version of the music is also below. With Final Cut Pro open, let's take a quick tour of the user interface. Final Cut Pro's main user window is divided into three separate work areas. The area in the upper left is for organizing your media, the area to the right is for playing back your media, and the area below is for editing your media. In the top left is the Libraries pane. This is where you organize and manage your libraries and events. Final Cut Pro opens with an empty library when launched for the first time. Libraries are like vaults that you store all your media and projects. Before importing your media, it's a good idea to rename your library. Click on the name and enter Anamorphic Vacation and press Return. All libraries contain at least one event. An event is like a folder for organizing your media. You can create more than one event, but for this simple project we'll be creating, you'll only need this one. We're going to perform a simple drag and drop operation to import the media. Start by selecting the event, then drag the Anamorphic Media folder into the empty browser. Doing this will copy all of the media into your library. Because the media is copied into the library, you no longer need the folder of media and you can trash it if you wish. Like the library, the event can be renamed to something more meaningful. Click the default name and enter Project Media and press Return. The media is imported as clips. Clips are not actual media, but simply pointers to where the media lives on your hard drive. Moving your mouse pointer over any clip will reveal a red vertical line called the skimmer. As you skim right or left over a clip, the video appears in the viewer to the right. To see a clip play in real time, skim to the frame you want to start viewing from, then press the spacebar. Press the spacebar again to halt playback. I'll skim to the middle of this Steve intro clip and play back a few seconds. And what I discovered is this cool little adapter from a company called Moment. It's an anamorphic adapter the clips you're working with came from a product review I did for our YouTube channel. As you just heard, the adapter creates widescreen footage that gives your iPhone footage a cinematic look. You can already see the result of this adapter by these wider image thumbnails as compared to the more square shape of my two intro clips. If you need to increase or decrease the size of the clip thumbnails, click the clip appearance button, then drag the slider at the top. You'll also find it helpful to enable waveforms, so you can see which clips have audio associated with them and which ones do not. To begin the process of editing, we need to create what Final Cut Pro calls a project. Click the New Project button. A window will appear asking you to name your project. Enter My First Edit and click OK. A timeline will appear in the lower half of the UI, as indicated by the time ruler along the top and the dark horizontal strip in the center. The name of the active project you are working in appears above the timeline. In the browser, locate the Steve Intro 01 interview clip. Select it by clicking directly on the thumbnail. A yellow box appears around the clip. When you move your mouse, a white grabber glove appears. This is a visual cue for you to drag the clip into the timeline. 
drag into the dark gray strip until a green plus appears, then release your mouse. Congratulations, you just made your first edit. Let's undo that by choosing Undo from the Edit menu. You may have noticed that there are actually two interview clips, and we can add them both to the timeline at once. With your mouse in the empty gray area, click and drag across both Steve clips. They become selected. Now drag them into the timeline and release your mouse. Moving your mouse above the clips in the timeline reveals a skimmer at the mouse pointer location. As you move the skimmer right or left, the viewer updates. In addition to the skimmer, there's a vertical white line called the playhead. When you skim to a location in your timeline, then press the spacebar, the skimmer and playhead become one, and the video plays in real time from that point forward. To move the play to the skimmer location, skim to the frame you want, then click in the gray area above the clip. You can also move the playhead independently of the skimmer by dragging the top of the playhead. Using one of these two methods, move the playhead to just before the cut to the second clip, and press the spacebar to play from there. Walk you through my process using this lens and this phone. So here's my vacation video shot with the Moment Anamorphic Adapter. The video transition from the first intro clip to the next needs some tightening up to remove the dead space. During the editing process, you'll often need to zoom in to get a closer look at your edits and for making more precise adjustments. Move the playhead near the edit point. To zoom in, click the Clip Appearance button on the toolbar, then drag the Zoom Level slider to zoom in. The reason I had you move the playhead to the edit point is that zooming will always be focused around the playhead. While we have this window open, let's change the clip display options so that we can see a larger audio waveform for our clips. Choose the one second from the left. This option presents a nice big audio waveform, making it easier to make audio edits. You can also make the clips taller by dragging on this slider. The waveform is a visual representation of audio amplitude. The gaps in the waveform are sentence or word breaks, and longer pauses in his delivery. You can see where the end of his last sentence is located here. Move the playhead just to the right of this. We want to remove this unwanted portion at the end of the clip. From the Trim menu, choose Trim End. The clip is trimmed to the current playhead position. Now let's clean up the start of the incoming clip. Move the playhead just before he begins his next sentence then choose Trim Start from the Trim menu. To play back our edit, skim to the left of the edit point and press the spacebar. I process using this lens and this phone. So here's my vacation video. Now if you press the spacebar again, you'll hear that I delivered two other takes of this line. Shot with the Moment Anamorphic Adapter. That was good, do it one more time. Okay. So here's my vacation video shot with the Moment anamorphic adapter. So here's my vacation video shot with a moment anamorphic adapter. After watching my delivery, perhaps I decide I like the third take better. So let's look at another way to trim. Move the playhead just before my first word. Then from the trim menu choose blade. The clip is split at the playhead and now we have three clips in the timeline. Select the middle clip. That's the portion we don't want. Then press Delete on your keyboard. Let's play that edit back. My process using this lens and this phone. So here's my vacation video shot with a Moment Anamorphic Adapter. There's some unwanted frames here at the end of his delivery we should get rid of. Move your playhead just past the end of his last word. We're going to trim the end of this clip, but this time using a keyboard shortcut. Press Option Right Bracket. The end of the clip is trimmed to the playhead. Let's use a similar shortcut at the beginning of the timeline. Move the playhead to just before his first word and press Option Left Bracket. Press your spacebar to hear the cleaned up intro. Hey guys, I just got back from San Diego. So to recap, Option Left Bracket trims the start of a clip and Option Right Bracket trims the end of a clip. In addition to those trimming shortcuts, there are a few more that are worth remembering. Editing often requires zooming out and zooming in. Press Command Plus to zoom in and Command Minus to zoom out. When you want to see all your clips at once in the timeline, press Shift Z. 
Shift-Z will fit all the clips within the available window space of your timeline. Let's look at one more shortcut. Skim and play back from anywhere in the middle of the first clip. It's an anamorphic adapter, and in a nutshell, what it does is it takes the image and squeezes it onto your sensor so you get this widescreen cinematic 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio. It looks really, really great. Now, you could achieve the same look in post by cropping the top and the bottom, but you're actually losing pixel data when you do that. So what I want to do is walk you through my process using this lens and this phone. After listening to this, I realized that there's another section I want to remove because the intro is a bit too long. Notice as I skim, a timecode readout appears below the viewer. This shows the current skimmer location in hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. Skim to around 30 seconds and play from there. In cinematic 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, it looks really, really great. Now, you could. I want to cut out the portion of the clip after he says, really, really great. You can see the last two words by these spikes in the waveform. Move the playhead after the last word and press Command B to split the clip. Select the unwanted portion and press Delete. Play over the edit to hear it. Aspect ratio it looks really, really great. So here's my vacation video. Now that our on camera talent has been edited, let's turn our attention to augmenting his story with clips using that anamorphic adapter he seems to be celebrating. In the browser, locate the Dell Wide Shot and skim over it. This will be our first shot because it establishes the location. Select the clip, then go to the Edit menu and choose Append to Storyline. This command places the clip at the end of the last clip in the timeline. In other words, an append edit. For the next clip, we'll use a close-up of the hotel. Select the Dell Spire clip. But instead of the menu, we'll use a shortcut. Press E. The clip is appended to the Dell Wide clip in the timeline. To save time, you can append multiple clips. Drag a marquee around the two Garden Plaza clips and press E. We now have six clips in our timeline. Let's skim to the beginning of the set and play back. You may have noticed that the Dell Spire clip has a lot of camera shake. Move the playhead directly over it. In the upper right corner of the toolbar, click the Inspector button to reveal it. The Inspector is where you make adjustments to your clips, such as scaling, cropping, effects, volume, and other adjustments, to name a few. The Inspector will always affect the clip directly under the playhead. There are four Inspector buttons along the top, one for video, color, sound, and metadata, depending on what adjustments you need to make. Make sure the video inspector is selected. Locate stabilization and place a check next to it. As indicated in the lower left of the viewer, this sets off an analysis algorithm that determines how much shake is in the clip and then addresses it automatically. Play back the clip. Problem solved. Let's add some music. In the browser, locate the music clip. Skim to the beginning of the clip and press the space bar to listen to it. I should point out that most music that you download from a website will be mastered at levels that are much too high. Select the clip. Then in the audio inspector, drag the volume slider until it reads minus 7 dB. Notice as you drag, the audio waveform reacts to the changes in volume. Drag the music below the video, but don't release your mouse just yet. You want the first note in the song to line up with the first frame of picture in the Dell wide shot. When you think you have it, release your mouse. Play the section back to hear it with video. Moment, anamorphic adapter. If you need to adjust the music's placement, select the clip, 
then press the period key to nudge the music one frame at a time later. Press the comma key to nudge the music one frame at a time earlier. Press Shift-Z to see all your clips. The music is longer than the four clips, but we'll add some more clips to fill it out shortly. Before that, let me show you how to add music beat markers that you can cut to. You'll have a lot of fun with this technique, and one you'll find yourself using quite a bit in your own projects. Move your playhead anywhere over the music clip, then select it. Press M on your keyboard. That's an easy one to remember. M for marker. A purple marker is added to the clip at the playhead location. Undo that by pressing Command Z. We're going to do the same thing, but this time while the clip plays back in real time. Before we do this, it's a good idea to play the clip, then do a count. Most pop music is in 4-4 time, making it fairly easy to identify the start of each musical measure. In 4-4 time, there are four beats per measure. I'll play this back and do a count for you. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 3, 4, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 3, 4. You get the idea. Now that I have a sense of the tempo and where the measures fall, we can add our beat markers. I'll do this first so you can watch me, then you can do it yourself. Move the play to the start of the clip, then select it. It's very important that you select the clip first. Now with my finger poised over the M key, I'll press the space bar to play back. I'm going to add a beat marker every two measures. I think five markers should cover us for this section. Now take a moment and do this yourself. If you mess up, just press Command Z to undo all the markers you added, then try it again. If you look at where our edits currently fall, they do not line up with our markers. Move the playhead somewhere over the four clips, then press Command Plus to zoom in. We're going to trim the end of each clip so that they align with each marker. Move your mouse cursor over an edit point. A trim icon will appear. Depending on which side of the edit your mouse cursor is over, a film strip will point to the clip that you'll be trimming. We want to adjust the end of each clip, so we want the film strip pointing to the left. Move the cursor over the edit point between the Dell Wide Shot and the Dell Spire Shot. When you see the film strip pointing to the left, click once with your mouse. The edit point becomes selected in red. Click and drag to the left until the edit point snaps to the marker. Now move your cursor over the edit point between the Dell Spire and the Garden Plaza 01 clips. Pay attention to the direction of the film strip, then click to select the edit point. Drag to the left until the edit point snaps to the marker. Now do the same for the edit points of the remaining clips. Let's play that back to see and hear how it all works. Okay, admit it, that's a pretty cool technique. Press Shift-Z to fit the clips to the window. For this last section of music, we'll add a series of shorter clips to the timeline to pick up the pace of the video. So far, we've added entire clips to the timeline without pre-editing them in any way. Now you're going to make selections to your clips in the browser before adding them to the timeline. Locate the Surf Dance clip in the browser. In order to better see our selections, we're going to change the view. Currently, we're looking at a film strip view of our clips. Clicking this button will present our clips in a spreadsheet-like layout. In this view, all of your clips appear in a list with columns of helpful information about each clip called metadata. We'll get to metadata and why it's important in a later lesson. For now, you can select any clip in the list and it appears with a longer film strip along the top that you can skim over. You can also use your down arrow and up arrow keys to quickly move between your clips. 
Press the down arrow a few times until you select the surf dance clip at the bottom of the list. I'm going to show you how to make selections with your mouse, then show you how to do it with keyboard shortcuts. To make a selection, skim to the frame you want the clip to start on, then drag to the right until you see the frame you want to end on, then release your mouse. When you add the clip to the timeline, only the portion of the clip within the yellow boundary will be added. Now let's look at something that may frustrate you when making selections. Go to the Mark menu and choose Clear Selected Ranges. If you click on the clip, you'll be creating a selection range for the entire clip. Final Cut then assumes you want to use the entire clip. So if you want to create a selection range with your mouse, you'll need to clear the range first. Press Option X to clear the range. With the range cleared, you'll now be able to drag to make selections. Here's another way to address this issue. I'll clear the range, then select the entire clip again. You don't technically need to clear the range. If you hold down the Option key and drag, you're overriding whatever range was already selected. I'll clear the range again by pressing Option X. While watching the timecode info below the viewer, skim to 38 seconds. This is the frame where Jill begins moving backward in the surf. Drag until the tooltip reads 1 second and 10 frames. This number reports the duration of the clip within the selected range. Press E to append the range to the timeline. What's great about creating selection ranges is that we can use different portions of the same clip. Skim over toward the end of the clip where we see a closer shot of Jill at about 55 seconds. Drag to the right until the duration tooltip again reads 1 second and 10 frames. Press E to append it to the timeline. Let's play that back by skimming into the last garden shot and pressing the spacebar. The timing feels right, but I don't like the shot order. I would prefer seeing the closer shot of her before cutting to the wide silhouette shot. To swap the clip order, drag the last shot to the left to insert it at the previous cut point, then release your mouse. Let's take a look. I like that much better. Let's look at another way to create selection ranges that is often faster than dragging. Select the McLaren Trio clip and skim over it. Again, we won't be using the entire shot. While watching the timecode readout, skim 10 seconds into the clip and press I to mark the range endpoint. Skim to 17 seconds, then press O to mark a range out point. Before adding the clip to the timeline, I find it helpful to view just my selection in real time to get a feel for it. From the View menu, choose Playback, Play Selection. Only the clip range is played back. Append this clip to the timeline by pressing E. Let's add two more shots. Locate the Spire Deck on one clip and mark the range in point at 9 seconds and the range out point at 12 seconds. Press E. Locate the Spire Deck 03 clip and skim to 22 seconds and press I. Let's say that I wanted the end of the range to end at exactly 3 seconds from the end point. Instead of dragging, press Ctrl D on your keyboard. The timecode display below the viewer turns blue, indicating the duration of the selection range. Currently, the duration is 4 seconds. To make the duration 3 seconds, type out 3, 0, 0, and press Return. Press E to add this last clip to the timeline. We're going to focus on these last four clips. Move the playhead over the McLaren Trio and press Command Plus a few times to zoom in. Then pan over a bit to center them up in the window. Without needing to play back these clips, we can already tell that they're too long. We're going to apply some speed changes to each clip to make them shorter. With your playhead parked over the McLaren clip, Click the down arrow to the right of the speedometer icon to bring up clip retiming options. Choose Custom. A window appears with many options for controlling clip speed. Currently, the default speed of the clip is 100%. Enter 450 and make sure Ripple is checked. Press Return to set the value, then the Escape key to exit the window. A blue timing bar appears above the clip, reporting the speed value we entered. Let's play that back. Let's look at an alternate way you can control the speed of a clip. Park your playhead over the next clip. Then from the Retime menu, choose Show Retime Editor. 
This command reveals a green retiming bar over the clip. The speed is currently set at 100%. To retime the clip interactively, move your mouse pointer over the right edge of the retiming bar until you see the retime icon appear. Dragging to the left will speed the clip up, and dragging to the right will slow the clip down. Drag until the timing bar reports a speed of 75%. For this final shot, I prefer that the camera push into Jill rather than pull back. Let's use a keyboard shortcut for calling up the retime window. Press Control Option R. Select the radio button next to Reverse, then press the Escape key. When the clip has been reversed, the timing bar will present reverse facing arrows. Let's play back. If you need to make adjustments to the timing, just drag on the right edge of the timing bar. Here, I'll adjust the McLaren's timing so that it ends at a beat marker. After playing back the car shot, it kind of seems out of place. Let me show you how to replace a shot in the timeline. In the browser, locate the beach walk clip and mark an endpoint just as the camera frames up Jill. Leave the range out point set at the end of the clip. Drag the selection over the McLaren shot and wait for the clip to turn white with a plus icon. Then release your mouse. A menu of replace options appears. Choose replace with three time to fit. This option will automatically adjust the speed of the clip to match the duration of the clip you're replacing. As you can see in the timing bar, the clip was sped up to 107% in order to honor the timeline clip's duration. Let's play that back. That shot works much better. Sometimes a well-placed transition or two can spice up your videos. I want to transition into this final shot of Jill looking out at the beach. To reveal the transition browser, click the bow tie looking icon at the far right of the toolbar. Transitions are organized into categories. Select the Lights category. You can preview a transition by skimming over it. Drag the Bloom transition over the last edit point. When you see the green plus icon, release your mouse. Play it back to see how it looks. Most transitions are one second by default. If you want to make the transition longer or shorter, just drag on the edge of the transition. The tooltip reports a new duration. When it reads 15 frames, release your mouse and play it back again. Let's create an animated effect. Scroll over to the first intro clip at the beginning of the timeline. Skim roughly 20 seconds into it and play back. It's an anamorphic adapter, and in a nutshell, what it does is it takes the image and squeezes it onto your sensor so you get this widescreen cinematic 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio. So here he's talking about what an anamorphic adapter does to iPhone footage, and I'd like to illustrate this with an animated image crop. Play back again and pause right after he says, it takes the image. It's an anamorphic adapter, and in a nutshell, what it does is it takes the image. Split the clip at the playhead by pressing Command B. Move the playhead anywhere to the right of the edit point. This little gray ball, called the Active Clip Indicator, lets Final Cut Pro know what clip you're about to change. You don't need to make a clip selection. Reveal the inspector and locate the crop section. These sliders control the image cropping along the left, right, top, and bottom of the frame. To reset the controls, click the caret icon to the far right of the parameter and choose Reset Parameter. You can also enter numerical values. Click inside the input field for top and enter 135. Press the Tab key to jump down to the bottom input field and enter 135 again. In the viewer, the top and bottom of the frame are now identically cropped. If you move your playhead over the next clip, it does not have cropping, but we'd like it to. To save us from having to input those same cropping values for this clip, we're going to perform a copy-paste operation. Select the clip with the crop applied and press Command-C to copy it. Select the clip without the crop applied and from the edit menu choose Paste Effects. 
play over the edit point. Really, really great. So here's my vacation video. The crop looks great across both clips, but we have an obvious jump cut we'll need to deal with. But before we get to that, I'd like to animate the crop so that it comes on more elegantly. Skim back to the edit point and play the clips, listening for where he says, squeezes it onto your sensor, and pause playback. Image and squeezes it onto your sensor. In the inspector, locate the top and bottom parameters you adjusted a few moments ago. At the far right of the parameter are diamonds. These are used for setting keyframes. Keyframes are used for locking in the values of an effect at a specific time. Set keyframes for top and bottom by clicking their respective diamonds. Move your playhead to the edit point by pressing the up arrow key on your keyboard. Back in the inspector, drag the top and bottom sliders to the left until they both read zero. Because we already set initial keyframes for the crop later in time, Final Cut Pro automatically creates keyframes for the new values earlier in time. Let's play that back to see how it looks. And squeezes it onto your sensor so you get this widescreen cinematic 2.4 to 1. That looks great, but what if we wanted the effect to happen faster? Right click on the clip and choose Show Video Animation. Press Command Plus to zoom in if you need to. The keyframes we set appear along this bar labeled Trim All. To make the animation faster, drag the second set of keyframes toward the first set and play back. Image and squeezes it onto your sensor so you get this. If you want to slow down the animation, drag them in the opposite direction. When you're done, click the X to close the animation controls. Skim to roughly 30 seconds and play back from there. 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio. It looks really, really great. So here's my vacation video. So did you notice the jump cut from the first intro clip into the second? I'll play that back again in case you missed it. 4 to 1 aspect ratio. It looks really, really great. A jump cut is a continuity break between two shots where the subject appears to jump from one spot to another in the frame. Jump cuts occur when cutting between two different sections of a clip with the exact same camera angle. They're particularly prevalent, and as it happens, somewhat necessary, in long interview clips because you often need to remove material to tighten up the delivery. Modern content creators often leave jump cuts in as an aesthetic choice, but in the past, they were something to be hidden. Because I'm old school, I prefer hiding them. One of the best ways to hide a jump cut is by covering it with a related clip, often called B-roll. Locate the Spire Deck O2 clip in the browser. We're going to use the entire clip, so select it, then drag it into the timeline. Align the right edge of the clip with the edit point. You'll know when you've aligned it properly when you see a vertical yellow line called a snapping indicator. When you see this line and the plus icon, release your mouse. You've just connected this B-roll clip to the primary storyline. The vertical bar at the start of the clip is the connection point. You can think of this connection as an anchor point. If you move the clip it's connected to, the connected clip travels with it. I'll have much more to say about connected clips in future lessons. When a clip is connected above another one in the timeline, the clip on top gets visual priority. You can always disable the top clip to reveal the bottom clip by pressing V on your keyboard. Let's play the clip back with the B-roll. Image and squeezes it onto your sensor so you get this widescreen cinematic 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio. It looks really, really great. So here's my vacation video. Great, we've covered quite a bit of ground in this lesson, but we're not finished yet. We still have some audio work to do, and there's a lot we can do to improve the image through color grading. We'll be addressing the sound before making our color adjustments. This is because color correction, or grading, is usually the last step in the process prior to outputting your movie. Make sure you have the anamorphic vacation library open that you were working on in the previous lesson. The first job of a sound editor is to make the dialogue or the person speaking sound clear and intelligible. Before you can properly judge the sound, you should have a good pair of speakers sitting on your desk at ear level. Second, you'll need to watch your audio levels using the built-in digital meters. To bring them up, click on the meters graphic below the viewer. Let's play the first intro clip back from the beginning and watch the digital meters. Hey guys, I just got back from San Diego for some much needed R&R. Now my wife always says, whenever I bring camera gear, I never really go on vacation. 
So I the meters display the audio signal as a measurement called decibel full scale or DBFS. Your dialogue should be falling between negative 12 and negative 6 on the meters for internet delivery. The dialogue is currently falling between minus 20 and minus 12, and we therefore need to raise the volume by 6 dBFS. Move your pointer over the first intro clip. You'll see a white horizontal line in the upper part of the waveform. This is an adjustable volume control bar. Moving your pointer over the line shows you the current volume delta of the clip. Currently, it reads zero. This does not mean that the clip has no volume. It simply means that no volume changes have been made to the clip. To increase the volume, drag up. To decrease the volume, drag down. The waveform reacts to the change in volume. Drag until the tooltip reports 6 dB. Then play back while watching the meters. Hey guys, I just got back from San Diego for some much needed R&R. &R. Now my wife always says, whenever I bring camera gear, I never really go- The volume is now at our target zone. There are two other dialog clips that need the same adjustment. Select the clip with the volume change and press Command-C to copy it. Click in the gray area to deselect the clips, then hold down the Command key and select the clips that need the volume change. From the Edit menu, choose Paste Attributes. A window appears that will let you selectively add or remove attributes before pasting. Because the only attribute on the clip we copied from was a volume change, this is the only attribute targeted to be pasted, as indicated by the checkmark. The graphic at the top tells you what clip you copied from and how many clips you're about to copy to. Click Paste. The volume change is pasted to the clips and their waveforms update. Scroll over to the Dell Spire clip. You can see that this is the only shot in the montage sequence that has audio. With the playhead over the clip, you can solo it by clicking the headphone icon on the toolbar. This isolates the audio from the other clips so you can hear it without distraction. We really don't need sound for this clip because we'll be using a sound effect. Drag the volume bar all the way down until you see the infinity symbol. Then turn off soloing. As I mentioned, these clips were not recorded with audio, save the one clip you just adjusted. Even though the music hides this fact, your soundtracks will be much richer by including environmental ambience. Because the sound we'll be using was recorded separately, these sound effects are often called wild sounds. A good place to find wild sound and other sound effects is the photos and sound sidebar. Click the button in the upper toolbar. Select the sound effects category. When you install Final Cut Pro, a number of sound effects will appear in a searchable list. You can preview any of them by double clicking. The location of the hotel in the video is at the beach, so let's search for some ocean sounds by entering that in the search bar. I'll preview a few of them. I like the sound of Water Ocean 2, and it includes the sound of seagulls. Drag the sound effect clip into the timeline. Place it between the picture and music clip. Watching the snapping indicator, align the left edge of the clip with the beginning of the music clip. Let's play that back. Moment, anamorphic adapter. The wild sound is obviously too loud as compared to the music. Drag the volume bar until the tooltip reads minus 15 dB. Skim over toward the end of the song and play back. At this point, the music has a natural fade out as you can see by the slope in the waveform. It would be a nice touch to slowly raise the volume of the ocean as the music fades. If you need to, zoom into the last clip so you can more easily make adjustments. Like we did when we animated the crop in the previous lesson, we'll use keyframes to control the volume. Move the play to the beginning of the video transition. This is the point where the sound begins to taper off. 
Move your pointer over the volume line in the sound effect while keeping it aligned with the playhead. Hold down the Option key and you'll see a tiny diamond appear. This is your cue to click on the volume bar to set a keyframe. Move the play to the end of the transition and Option click again. Drag upward on the second keyframe until the tooltip reads minus 9 dB. The first keyframe set the volume level at minus 15 and the second keyframe raised it to minus 9. To control the rate of fade, drag the second keyframe right or left. Play that back. The next thing we need to address is the length of the sound effect. It's much longer than we need. Move the playhead to the end of the music, then press Option Right Bracket to trim the sound to the playhead. Let's add some fades to the end of the sound effect in music. Place your pointer in the upper right corner of the sound effect. A fade handle appears. When you see the left and right facing arrows, drag the fade handle to the left. A tooltip tells you the duration of the fade as you drag. I want a second and a half fade out, which should align with the end of the picture. Let's play that back to hear the change. After watching this, perhaps we want to extend the picture to match the sound. With the play it over the last clip, press Command R to bring up the retiming bar. Drag the right edge of the timing bar until the clip aligns with the end of the soundtrack. It would also be a nice touch to have the picture fade with the audio. Right click on the clip and choose Show Video Animation. Double click the opacity bar to expand it. In the upper right corner of the bar, you'll see the same fade handle that appeared on the audio clips. Drag to the left while watching the tooltip. We want the video fade to match the second and a half duration of the audio fades. Let's play that back. Very cool. Close the animation window when you're done. As extra credit, go back and add fades to the beginning of the project. And now it's time to turn our attention to improving the contrast and color of our shots using a process called color correction or color grading. Often these terms are used interchangeably, but you can think of color correction as what you do to fix problems with the shot, and grading is what you do to make the shot look better than where it started. Whatever term you use, the intent is to improve exposure and color balance, overcome visual inconsistencies, and manipulate color to enhance the emotion of the story you're telling. Let's look at a textbook example of why color correction is necessary. Park the playhead over the Dell Spire shot. This shot does not have much contrast and the colors don't pop. Plus, the shot appears to have a yellowish cast. Now there are many reasons your shots are not what you intended, and that's an entire subject on its own, but I want to show you some basic tools you can use to make them look better. The first tool we'll look at is Balance Color. Click on the Dell Spire clip to select it. A clip is selected when a yellow border appears around it. To apply the correction, click the menu next to the magic wand icon on the toolbar and choose Balance Color. To see a before and after, click the checkbox next to Balance Color in the inspector. The reddish cast in the image was compensated for by introducing more blue into the highlights. This is most evident in the white paint of the hotel facade. When using an automatic control like this one, you're relying on Final Cut Pro to determine how to white balance a shot. Sometimes it gets it right, but more often than not, it gets it wrong. In my opinion, the image went from looking too red to now looking too blue. Thankfully, there's a supplemental tool you can use to tell Final Cut Pro what is supposed to be white. From the method menu for balance color, choose white balance. Move the cursor over the viewer. You'll see an eyedropper that will allow you to choose what's supposed to be a neutral color. Click on the white wall in the center of these four windows. Final Cut Pro will analyze the color makeup of your sample, then correct the color balance by adding the opposite color. Try clicking on different objects in the frame that are supposed to be white. You'll get slightly different results depending on whether the white you are sampling was pure white or had a taint of some other color. To see the extreme result of what this tool is attempting to do, click on the red awning or the red roof of the hotel. In its attempt to neutralize the red, it pushed the image in an extreme blue direction. 
select the paint between the windows, then disable the eyedropper to accept the change. While this image is looking better, it could be much better. With the clip still selected, click the Color Inspector button at the top of the inspector window. This reveals Final Cut Pro's color board. This color board is actually one of four different color corrections at your disposal. Clicking the menu at the top will reveal all of them, but for this lesson, we'll only be using the color board. Along the top of the color board are three different color adjustment panes, exposure, saturation, and color. When color correcting your images, it's always best to start with exposure first in order to get the contrast looking right. The exposure pane has four different adjustment controls, or pucks. The three pucks in the center are for adjusting the three tonal regions in the image, shadows, midtones, and highlights. Dragging on the shadows puck, for example, will affect the darkest regions in the image, while dragging on the highlights puck will affect the lightest regions. To reset a puck, just double click on it. You can also reset all the pucks by clicking this arrow. The puck at the far left is the global adjustment that affects the contrast of the entire image. As I mentioned before, this image looks washed out, which is to say that it does not have very good contrast. We can deal with that by darkening the midtones. Drag the midtones puck downward until the value reads minus 65%. Select the Highlights puck and drag upward until the value reads 15%. What we've done is stretch the contrast to give the image more pop. Once we're happy with the contrast, the next step is to jump into the Saturation pane. Saturation controls the amount of color in your image. There are separate pucks for the shadows, midtones, and highlights. For example, you can make the color of the sky more intense by dragging upward on the Highlight puck. For saturation, I often use the global puck to increase the overall saturation of the image. Let's drag this control until the value reported is 20%. Let's see a before and after by clicking the checkbox next to color board. One final adjustment to make is to the color itself. The gray puck on the left is a global color balance control. This control affects the color balance in all three tonal ranges shadows, midtones, and highlights. The puck is sitting on a white horizontal line separating the color board into positive and negative color regions. Currently, the global control is over the green color field. Dragging downward on the puck in the negative direction, you'll be removing green from the image. Removing green results in more red being introduced into the image. Dragging above the neutral line into the positive color field will add more green into the image. If you want to add more blue into the image, Drag the global control to the right until it's over the blue color field, then drag upward. Dragging below the white line, of course, removes blue and will add the opposite color, which is yellow. The negative colors are not arbitrary. Yellow is the opposite of blue on the color wheel. Double click the puck to reset it. You can also adjust the colors independently in the three tonal regions. A good example of when you might do this is to add a different color to the sky to affect the mood of the shot. Drag the highlight puck over the orange field at roughly 40 degrees. Drag upward on the puck until the value reads 10%. I shot this hotel close to sunset, and adding some orange into the highlights gives the shot a warmer feel. The thing about color correction is that there's no right or wrong. Someone else correcting this shot might have taken a different approach. At the end of the day, you decide what looks good. Let's move on to the next shot of the garden plaza. Overall, this shot looks pretty good right out of the camera, but as I said, when approaching color correction, it's always better to ask, can I make this shot look even better? Select the clip, and as before, we'll start in the exposure pane. The highlights look good, and the hotel in the background looks nicely exposed. One small adjustment I would make is to drop the shadows to negative 10, so that there's even more contrast between the foreground trees and the hotel. This small change will better draw the viewer's eye to the subject. Let's look at a before and after. When color correcting, it's important to keep in mind that you don't need to make large sweeping changes to the color board. Sometimes, just a small tweak here and a small tweak there will be all you need to improve the shot. Let's move on to the next shot. The shadows look good, and I don't want to mess with them because I'll lose all the image detail in the plants. 
I do, however, want to brighten up the highlights. Instead of using the puck, you can enter a value. Enter 20 for highlights and press return. Now jump into the saturation pane and set the global value to 25 and press return. Let's see the before and after. The next three shots all occur at sunset and they need to look like they were all recorded at the same time of day so as to maintain visual continuity. With the playhead over the surf dance shot, select the clip, reveal the exposure pane, and set the midtones value to minus 37. Move over to the saturation pane and set the midtone saturation value to 7. Then move to the color pane and set the midtones puck to 28 degrees at a value of 15%. For this next shot of Jill on the beach, let's look at another way to control the pucks. Hold down the Option key and click on the clip. Option clicking will select the clip and park the playhead over the clip in one gesture. Select the midtones puck, then press and hold down the arrow key. When you get in the negative 30s, release the mouse and tap the key. Each tap will increment the value. Tap until the value reads minus 37. Move into the saturation pane, select the midtones puck, and tap the up arrow until the value reads 7. Select the color pane, then for the midtones, enter 20 in the degrees input field, which will move the puck over the orange color field. Press the tab key to move the cursor into the percentage field. Now use your up arrow key until the color value reports 15%. Locate the last shot in the series and option click on it to select it. Because this clip of Jill walking on the beach was recorded at the same time of day as the previous shot, we should be able to match the color without needing to use the color board at all. Then from the Enhancements menu, choose Match Color. In the timeline, skim over the previous shot looking for a frame to match to. The skimmer includes a camera icon that indicates you'll be taking a snapshot of the color information at that particular frame. Click once with your mouse and you'll get a preview of the clip with the color information applied on the right side of the viewer. If you like what you see, confirm it by clicking the Apply Match button. That looks really good. I think the image could use a bit more contrast, so let's pull down the exposure midtones to minus 30. Let's play back these three shots to see how they work as a related series of shots. You can really see what a difference just a few adjustments to the exposure and color can make to improve the look of your videos. I've left a few shots in the timeline uncorrected so you can practice with the tools you just learned. If you park the playhead over any of the talking head intro clips, you'll see that they could use some contrast and some additional color saturation. So have fun making me look better. Before we end this lesson, let me show you how to output a movie for YouTube or Facebook. With the timeline active, click the share button in the upper right corner of the toolbar. From the menu, choose YouTube and Facebook. Click the settings button to reveal how the movie will be formatted and optimized for these social media platforms. The resolution will be 1920 by 1080 unless you lower the resolution using this menu. An estimated file size appears in the lower right corner. Click Next and name your movie if you wanted to have a name other than the project name. Choose a destination on your Mac and click Save. Well, if you made it this far, congratulations. I hope you had a great time cutting the video with me. If you like our channel, please consider giving us a sub. And thanks for watching.